Hey everyone, uh, before the video starts, I just wanted to let you know that if you skip to the very end of this video, what you'll find is a Carl Jung book being read by um, an AI speech reader. Um, and I actually find this method of reading very helpful. Um, because of it, I've been able to read a lot more books. I have ADHD, so like reading books is the most stressful thing. And I have to read a lot of books for this channel. Um, but being able to, to just uh, sit back and let the the book read itself has been really helpful for me. And I wanted to make this format of each of Carl Jung's books, as well as other books that I will be um, uh, doing in the future, available to Patreon subscribers. So if you guys could check out that recording and see if the speed is okay, if it's understandable, if the if the voice is okay, that would be super awesome. And if you want to be able to read the book yourself in this format, you can do so by subbing to me on Patreon. And once you do so, you can gain access to the Discord server and then gain access to all of those videos. I always say that if people are really fascinated by this stuff, that they should go back and read the original material because um, my videos are naturally going to be colored by my biases. And so it's important to be able to go back to the original material and form your own opinion. But anyways, thanks for watching. And if you do subscribe, thank you so much. Uh, but anyways, on with the video. One of the most perplexing mysteries in the history of human evolution is how we were able to transition from small hunter-gatherer bands to well-ordered, functional civilizations ranging from a few hundred individuals to several thousand. For the nearly 200,000 years which our species has existed, the hunting and gathering lifestyle to which we evolved predominated until about 10,000 years ago, which is when the Neolithic Revolution occurred. This is when humans developed agriculture and their group size began to increase, eventually developing into the large city-states that were found in Mesopotamia, Egypt, and the Indus Valley. In an amazingly short period of time, we have gone from only being able to form small bands to living in enormous, staple cities. The problem for psychohistorians is understanding what kind of psychological changes would allow for humans to cooperate on such a large scale. The issue with large groups is that they're difficult to control. When primate social groups exceed a certain level, splintering usually occurs, where the group breaks off and forms subgroups, as dominant individuals compete with one another. The question is, how are humans able to avoid group splintering? There are a few proposed solutions to this problem, but the bicameral mind hypothesis proposes that humans evolved a special kind of psychological system which helped in controlling their behavior and structuring their societies into rigid hierarchies. This mentality also coincided and is dependent on the idea of gods, which can be viewed as a psychological tool which enabled humans to form larger and larger groups without splintering. The word bicameral literally means the condition of being divided into two chambers, and the bicameral mind refers to the fact that the two hemispheres of the human brain may have had different functions. And this split allows for human behavior to be more easily controlled, as Julian Jaynes wrote, At one time, human nature was split in two, an executive part called a god, and a follower part called a man. Neither part was conscious. The right hemisphere can be roughly described as the god part of this psychology, while the left hemisphere can be understood as the man side. Orders and commands originated from the right hemisphere, and were delivered to the left hemisphere using an auditory hallucination, which the person then obeyed. But what was this mentality actually like? It can be described as a psychological system where a person feels as though they are commanded by gods who come in the form of voices which tell the person what to do. Since this mentality precedes ego consciousness, bicameral humans had no sense of self, no ego, and could not narratize the way modern people do. Bicameral men were noble automatons who knew not what they did. Why gods though? Well, this would explain why gods exist in history at all. Anyone who looks closely at ancient civilizations will immediately recognize just how strange it is that they were so religiously devoted. And if you want to see what I mean, you can click this video popping up over here, where I examine the evidence of this mentality in ancient Egypt. In contrast to our modern state of consciousness, the bicameral mind, as proposed by Julian Jaynes, is a significantly different kind of human mentality. And it's immensely difficult for us as conscious human beings to understand what it, what it would have been like for our early ancestors. One thing that may be particularly hard to wrap our minds around is the fact that these voices sound just like real voices, as though someone were really talking. And we do undoubtedly know that such hallucinations do occur, and they really do sound like real audible voices. This can be seen in some people who suffer from schizophrenia. As one patient noted in describing his voices to the doctor, Yes sir, I hear voices distinctly, even loudly. They interrupt us at this moment. It is more easy for me to listen to them than to you. I can more easily believe in their significance and actuality, and they do not ask questions. 
Jane's hypothesized that the voices heard by schizophrenic patients are similar to the voices heard in bicameral times. Schizophrenia today is considered a dysfunctional state of mind, but in the bicameral past, as mankind was becoming more civilized, this mentality would have been a significant survival advantage, especially over the state of non-consciousness. Even people who are not schizophrenic occasionally experience auditory hallucinations during stress-inducing situations. Because we know that such voices exist, there must be some innate structure evolved in the human brain which allows for them. It is possible that in the past, evolution selected for people who experienced auditory hallucinations, and modern schizophrenia is a carryover from a time when this state of mind was actually a survival advantage. Jaynes noted that the relationship between a patient and the voices they heard often varied. The voices in schizophrenia take any and every relationship to the individual. They converse, threaten, curse, criticize, consult, often in short sentences. They admonish, console, mock, command, or sometimes simply announce everything that's happening. They yell, whine, sneer, and vary from the slightest whisper to a thunderous shout. Often the voices take on some special peculiarity, such as speaking very slowly, scanning, rhyming, or in rhythms, or even in foreign languages. There may be one particular voice, more often a few voices, and occasionally many. As in bicameral civilizations, they are recognized as gods, angels, devils, enemies, or a particular person or relative. Occasionally, hallucinations also have a visual component. These instances are relatively rare, and it's unclear whether they played a role in volition during the bicameral eras of history. If they did, we could imagine a god appearing in a visual hallucination to give an order, and the person would have no idea that they were only seeing a hallucination. From their perspective, it's like literally the gods are just speaking to them. This occurs in modern schizophrenics in sometimes very unusual ways. Occasionally, in what are called acute twilight states, whole scenes, often of a religious nature, may be hallucinated even in broad daylight, the heavens standing open with a god speaking to the patient. These voices often assume a controlling and commanding nature, demanding that the person perform certain actions, and it is frequently very difficult for schizophrenics to resist the urge to follow and obey them. Very often, the voices criticize a patient's thoughts and actions. Sometimes they forbid him to do what he was just thinking of doing, and sometimes this occurs even before the patient is aware of his intention. Jaynes describes one remarkable case of volition, or in other words, decision-making, being controlled by an auditory hallucination. And I actually discussed this case in my most recent YouTube short, which you can view by clicking here. And you can also check out my other shorts if you're interested. By the way, I'm making YouTube shorts now. <laughs> Since the voices originate from the right hemisphere, they tend to reveal information which the right hemisphere obtained from the environment. As the right hemisphere makes perceptions, it is able to deliver this information to the left hemisphere using an auditory hallucination, or as Jaynes explains, of immense importance here is the fact that the nervous system of a patient makes simple perceptual judgments of which the patient's self is not aware, and these, as above, may be transposed into voices that seem prophetic. A janitor coming down a hall may make a slight noise of which the patient is not conscious, but the patient hears his hallucinated voice cry out, now someone is coming down the hall with a bucket of water. Then the door opens and the prophecy is fulfilled. Credence in the prophetic character of the voices, just as perhaps in bicameral times, is thus built up and sustained. The patient then follows his voices alone and is defenseless against them. The example of this patient helps to illustrate what life would have been like for a bicameral man. He would go about his day with no conscious awareness until a voice which sounded to him like a real voice directed him in some way based on the information the right hemisphere unconsciously obtained. This implies that the two hemispheres can act almost like different people. Despite the fact that the individual feels like the voices are coming from outside, these auditory hallucinations actually originate from within the person's brain, probably from the right hemisphere, just as the internal monologue of conscious individuals originate from the left hemisphere. However, bicameral humans would perceive the voices as originating from the outer world, in contrast to modern conscious people who are pretty well convinced that their internal monologue comes from within and that they are the cause of their own thoughts. But how do we know that these voices originate from the right hemisphere? There are several reasons why this might be the case. The two hemispheres of the brain are not perfectly symmetrical in terms of functioning. Most brain regions are not lateralized, meaning that they can be found on both hemispheres. However, this is not true for speech, which is lateralized and only appears on one hemisphere. And in most people, this tends to be the left. Some ambidextrous people do have speech areas on both hemispheres, but this is relatively rare, and some people do have speech transferred to the other hemisphere, but you can think of this as just being like, everything is flipped to the other side. So where the left hemisphere is supposed to be, it's actually on the right side. But the most important speech area is known as Wernicke's area, because damage to this area results in a permanent loss of speech. 
unless the person is young enough that the other hemisphere can take on the function of language control. The areas on the right side of the brain that correspond to Wernicke's areas that are on the left side of the brain seem to have no function on the right side. However, experiments have shown that when you electrically stimulate these areas, which again seem to have no function, you can actually produce auditory hallucinations. I'll read one case from James's book. When stimulated in this region, case 7, a 20-year-old college student cried out, Again, I hear voices. I sort of lost touch with reality, humming in my ears and a small feeling like a warning. And when stimulated again, voices the same as before, I was just losing touch with reality again. So this patient's description of them losing touch with reality is very reminiscent of them temporarily losing conscious awareness as the voices acted upon them, which again is exactly what a bicameral person would have experienced because they wouldn't have experienced any sort of consciousness. They just would have experienced this voice kind of compelling them to do something. In another example, a 14-year-old girl, case 15, when stimulated on the superior posterior gyrus of the right temporal lobe, cried out, Oh, everybody is shouting at me again. Make them stop. The stimulus duration was 2 seconds. The voices lasted 11 seconds. She explained, They are yelling at me for doing something wrong. Everybody is yelling. At all stimulation points along the posterior temporal lobe of the right hemisphere, she heard yelling. And even when stimulated an inch and a half posterior to the first point, she cried out, There they go, yelling at me, stop them. And the voices coming from just one stimulation lasted 21 seconds. Recent studies have also shown that schizophrenia is associated with a failure of the brain to lateralize language functions. So normally language functions are lateralized in one hemisphere, but occasionally they are shared between the hemispheres. And in this case, people will very often experience auditory hallucinations. In fact, generally speaking, the brains of schizophrenics are less lateralized than neurotypical brains. As the authors of this paper put it, schizophrenic symptoms are what happens when at a late stage of neurodevelopment in adult life, as we have shown, the process of lateralization of the phonological component of the left hemisphere fails. We speculate that the segregation of function, on which the coherence of language depends, breaks down. Thoughts that are normally autonomous and strictly under the individual's control are experienced as influenced by the environment, thought insertion and withdrawal, and unconfined to the individual. These results show that the right hemisphere may have structures for producing hallucinations which are no longer needed in the modern world but can be reactivated with stress or through genetic anomalies or through electrical stimulation. If James's theory about the right hemisphere origin of auditory hallucinations is correct, then it is almost as if the right hemisphere is attempting to communicate with the left hemisphere, but because the patient's sense of self and their ego originates from the left hemisphere, they don't identify the hallucination as coming from themselves, although in reality the hallucination is expressing information which is contained in the right hemisphere of the brain. Just think about how creepy this is. It is as if the right hemisphere has difficulty asserting itself in behavior, and so tries to talk to the left hemisphere in a non-conscious way. It's like a part of your brain is just alien to your ego. If we examine the structure of these areas of the brain more closely, we discover a connection between the two speech areas via a collection of brain cells called the anterior commissure, and James believes that this acts as a bridge to send messages between the hemispheres. Here I suggest is the tiny bridge across which came the directions, which built our civilizations and founded the world's religions, where God spoke to men and were obeyed because they were human volition. Perceptions made by the right hemisphere are communicated to the other side of the brain through language. Consider the evolutionary problem. Billions of nerve cells processing complex experience on one side and needing to send the results over to the other through the much smaller commissures. Some code would have to be used, some way of reducing very complicated processing into a form that can be transmitted through the fewer neurons, particularly of the anterior commissures. What better code has ever appeared in the evolution of animal nervous systems than human language? One of the main hypotheses of this theory is that the two hemispheres of the brain are capable of acting like independent persons. The right hemisphere also has various characteristics that make it suitable for the role of a commanding god. According to Jaynes, the function of the gods was chiefly the guiding and planning of action in novel situations. The gods size up problems and organize action according to an ongoing pattern or purpose, resulting in intricate bicameral civilizations, fitting all the disparate parts together, planting times, harvest times, the sorting out of commodities, all the vast putting together of things in a grand design, and the giving of directions to the neurological man in his verbal analytical sanctuary in the left hemisphere. If this is true, we would expect the right hemisphere to have structures and functions needed for its role as the commanding god, the master so to speak. And the differences between the two hemispheres do point to this possibility. 
The fact that the right hemisphere is, unlike the left hemisphere, able to recognize faces may be reflective of one of the functions of the god mentality, that is to recognize faces and determine whether they're friendly or not, and then give the command to either attack or flee if the face is unfriendly. The right hemisphere is also better at organizing details into a perceptual whole, meaning that it is better able to make quick judgments about the environment. The right hemisphere is more involved in synthetic and spatial constructive tasks, while the left hemisphere is more analytic and verbal. The right hemisphere, perhaps like the gods, sees parts as having a meaning only within a context. It looks at holes, while the left or dominant hemisphere, like the man's side of the bicameral mind, looks at parts themselves. The right hemisphere is also better at sorting shapes, colors, and patterns, and is often better at solving puzzles such as mazes. If these hallucinations operated in the manner we have discussed, what causes them to be released? The answer to this, just as in schizophrenia, is simply stress. Stress occurs whenever there's this conflict within the psyche, whenever a decision needs to be made due to a new or unexpected situation, and the experimental evidence shows that this is the case. If two monkeys are placed in harnesses, in such a way that one of the monkeys can press a bar at least once every 20 seconds to avoid a periodic shock to both monkeys' feet, within three or four weeks, the decision-making monkey will have ulcers, while the other, equally shocked monkey will not. It is the pause of unknowingness that is important. For if the experiment is so arranged that an animal can make an effective response and receive immediate feedback of his success, executive ulcers, as they are often called, do not occur. Bicameral men had a different pattern of behavior when compared to conscious people. In a novel situation, conscious men need to narratize what to do, using their egos, but bicameral men would be told what to do by the right hemisphere in the form of an auditory hallucination. And this was perceived to be a god, a commanding god with higher authority. And because they were in this position of supreme authority, the person was compelled to obey them without question. The only stress necessary was that which occurs when a change in behavior is necessary because of some novelty in a situation. Anything that cannot be dealt with on the basis of habit, any conflict between work and fatigue, between attack and flight, any choice between whom to obey or what to do, anything that required any decision at all was sufficient to cause an auditory hallucination. Whenever a stressful situation occurs that can't just be resolved instinctually, the stress would cause an auditory hallucination, which would direct the man purposefully. In other words, in bicameral men, the gods take on the role of the ego. This system also had the advantage of allowing humans to persist at more complicated tasks which unconscious men, who were more similar to animals, would have difficulty with. Volition in modern humans depends on the ego, but in bicameral humans, the hallucinations from the gods provided the source of volition. The explanation of volition in conscious men is still a profound problem that has not reached any satisfactory solution, but in bicameral men, this was volition. Another way to say it is that volition came as a voice that was in the nature of a neurological command, in which the command and the action were not separated, in which to hear was to obey. The pervasiveness of gods in the history of humankind is reflective of the fact that gods were once very important in the functioning of society and in the volition of individual people. Our modern religions seem to be the heritage of an ancient time when the gods played a more direct role in human affairs. But why gods, or in other words, why this particular relationship between a god and his follower? In this video up here in the cards, I discussed how primate evolution gave rise to the idea of gods and how this led to a significant change in human social behavior. So check out that one if you're interested. But anyways, thanks for watching, have a good day, and may good luck always come your way. In that wide domain of psychopathic inferiority from which science has marked off the clinical pictures of epilepsy, hysteria, and neurasthenia, we find scattered observations on certain rare states of consciousness as to whose meaning the authors are not yet agreed. These observations crop up sporadically in the literature on narcolepsy, lethargy, automatisme ambulatory, periodic amnesia, double consciousness, somnambulism, pathological dreaminess, pathological lying, etc.